You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. So without further delay, I'd like to call up and introduce our next panel. Market Structure, Change on the Horizon, moderated by Steve Luparello, former Director, Division of Trading and Markets at the SEC. Steve? So... uh couple of things before we start. I've never had walk-up music before, and I really kind of like it, so I think we should insist on that from now on. I didn't know it was market structure change on horizon. Um, Greg had suggested that it be market structure race to the courthouse, but we can talk about that. Um, <laughs> not Greg Berman, some other Greg. Um, let me quickly, since we only have 45 minutes, let me very quickly introduce um, my fellow panelists. We are going to talk about uh, market structure, particularly the SEC proposals that have come down the pike in the last few months. To my immediate left is Greg Berman. He's the Managing Director for Market Analytics and Regulatory Structure at Citadel Securities. He and I have worked together on multiple occasions. I keep coming. He keeps leaving, but maybe uh, maybe that won't always happen. To his left is Megan Dugan, who is the Head of Options at NYSE. And at the very end is Mark Davies, who's the co-founder and CEO of S3. As I said, um, and as the prior panel um, uh, also alluded to, and I think, I think Joe may have perfectly summarized our panel in one sentence before he got off the stage, where he talked about the, the wisdom or the absence of wisdom or the concern about thinking about things in the equities context and then immediately attempting to transport them to the options context, which certainly does happen a lot. I had a theory before I went to the SEC, and that theory, I think, continued through during my time at the SEC, which is equities always gets more attention than options because it's easier. And options is always a little bit harder, and so you always get to equities first. And then if pressed, you think, well, it seems pretty reasonable on the equity side. Let's see how it works on the option side. And we'll talk about the four major equities regulatory proposals, what we th- very brief descriptions, what we think about them, what we think their likelihood of getting across the finish line are, but then it's already been floated by at least one commissioner, if not others, that if this proves to be successful on the equity side, and I'm not sure successful is defined as anything other than getting adopted, um, maybe we should look at transporting these proposals, three of the four, also to the options market, one best execution going there naturally. So with that, I'm going to go one by one and ask um, maybe Megan to start by giving a brief description of the order competition rule. Sure. Hello, everybody. I just want to make sure this is on. Great. So, right, I, I think we're going to be looking at this, or at least from my seat, as an options person and an options market maker an order flow provider previously and now an exchange operator, a lot of these things from a view from an options perspective. So broadly from the SEC side for the order competition rule, it is essentially bringing the retail equity marketable orders into a competitive state on an open exchange platform. So what does that mean? It means essentially bringing now every single retail order into a, um, in a space that has a an auction that has 100 milliseconds minimum to 300 milliseconds maximum uh, to an open exchange state with at least 1% equities market share. And 
in efforts to really provide liquidity in a price improvement perspective that may have not existed before. So the commission is looking to do this essentially for two reasons. One, essentially to provide um, additional lower fees as it relates to a price improvement on the order itself, um, as well as two, um, the ability to find additional market providers or market, um, market maker providers on the other side that can also provide competition on the order. So overall, this is supposed to be an area to provide liquidity, more liquidity to retail equity market, marketable orders. Um, but the, there's a lot of moving parts with this. I'm sure we'll dive into deeper, but essentially at, a, at an overview perspective, essentially that is the, the construct. Great, thanks, uh, Mark. Especially given your your role with S three and the, the the necessity of data and all these things, um, give us a brief uh, description of the proposed changes to Rule six hundred five. So you're probably already very familiar with six hundred five. You I, you all you either produce one now or you analyze them. Um, Rule six hundred five has been dated for quite a long time. It, it originally came into being in two thousand. And since at least 2010, various parties in the industry have been trying to update it. Um, the SEC is finally doing something about that. Um, basically, the, the sort of crux of what they're doing is increasing the client base. Client base, sorry. Maybe that's from my, a vendor perspective. Increasing the number of firms required to produce a 606, uh, 605. Uh, so that's going to include any retail firms that have over 100,000 accounts. They're going to include a summary report, which at this point in time, has seven distinct uh, numbers on it, and it's produced by everybody. Um, and it's going to improve the data quality of the information being presented. So, so today, for example, there are time buckets, and the, the smallest one is zero to nine seconds. And of course, in today's day and age, that's, that's absurd, right? Zero to nine seconds is an eternity. So there's a number of other specific statistics, but at the heart of it, it's, it comes down to those sort of three concepts, is improving the quality, Increasing the um, firms that need to produce it and adding uh, summary concepts so that it can be consumed by other than those in the industry. Great, thanks. And Greg, you get double duty, both um, uh, tick size increments and best execution. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> this is probably the hardest panel I've ever been on because Steve has asked me to. Um, provide an overview of two rules without giving any commentary <laughs> until the second part of the panel. Um, <clears throat> uh, you'll find in your seats there are seat belts because um, this gets a little, a little bumpy. So let's cover uh, first the tick sizes. So uh, today in equities, as long as you're priced above a dollar, um, as you may know, uh, tick size, the minimum tick increment for quoting, is one penny. It's one penny across the board. doesn't matter if stock is $3, $12. doesn't matter what the spread is. Uh, and people have talked about that maybe one size fits all is not the best thing. Uh, so the SEC has now proposed the following. Um, if the quoted spread averaged across time on a time-weighted basis on the last, cal on the last month of each quarter, then uh, is greater than four cents, then in the subsequent quarter, I told you you have to have seatbelts, then in the subsequent quarter, um, you leave it alone. So your four cents as the spread, you leave it alone going forward, you're still at a penny. But if you're less than four cents, but greater than 1.6 cents, we're going to have half a penny tick. So we're going to go to 50 mils, a half a penny, between 1.6 cents and four cents. But if you're less than 1.6 cents, but you're still greater than 0.8 cents, which doesn't exist today because it's not possible, but it might exist in the future, then you actually go to 0.2 cents or 20 mils. And after we go to 20 mils, and there's a break-in period, if any stocks go to less than 0.8 cents, then we're going to go to 10 mils or one-tenth of a penny. Unless it's the third Friday after a full moon, in which case we're going to go to a completely different regime. <laughs> so it gets, it gets very confusing, uh, a, lot, a lot of different ticks. Oh, I'm not supposed to comment, sorry. Um, <laughs> so that's the way that works. In addition, um, there's now this thing called the trading increment. So you can no longer trade at any price that is not exactly equal to a quote. So if your stock is trading... Uh, with quoting at five cents, uh, you can only trade five cents or four cents or three cents or two cents because your tick size is exactly penny. No more three and a half cent trades, no more price improvement at three and a half cents, et cetera. So that's on the tick size, the trading sizes. Built into that rule is also a couple other things. Access fees. Access fees today are basically capped at 30 mils. 
Uh, that will change. That will now be capped at 10 mils across the board, with the exception of the smallest tick increment. If your stock has a tick increment of 10 mils, then your access fee cap will go to 5 mils. We'll talk about the implications for that. And finally, the SEC has proposed to accelerate two aspects of the market data infrastructure rule uh, that is yet to be implemented and accelerate them forward now. One is odd lots. They want to have odd lots uh, on the SIP, including a new concept called the odd lot NBBO, as well as the round lot reform. So that, that's everything on the tick size side. Um, on the best execution side, the SEC um, says that they would like to have their own best ex- execution rule. Uh, the rule on the surface at the beginning um, sort of reads like FINRA rule 5310, but uh, the text of the rule is only three pages. You sort of have to read the other 350, 400 pages to understand how to interpret the rule. And uh, while we probably can't go into a lot of detail on those uh, in we only have six hours to this panel. It'll take longer to do that. Uh, it, it turns out that the rule is actually quite different, sufficiently different from the FINRA rule that FINRA has basically said they're going to have to change what they do in order to make sure it doesn't conflict. Uh, and the main aspect of, a, of conflict is this new thing called conflicted transactions. So if you read the rule today, for everybody who's ever done best X, um, there's one rule, one rule to rule them all. Um, if you have payment forward flow, you don't have payment forward flow, it doesn't make a difference. You have to treat everybody the same. FINRA has very strict regulations. In fact, the SEC has rules and regulations about that. Going forward, that's no longer the same. If you receive payment for order flow, if you pay payment for order flow, if you receive a rebate, if you pay a rebate. Um, so that means if you go to an options exchange and you get a, 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 a payment because it was a customer, you now are running a conflicted transaction. And when you have a conflicted transaction, uh, the rule does not say that you have to do what you need to do to deconflict in terms of reducing that. What the rule basically says is you have to go find and look at other sources of liquidity that you would otherwise not have done if you did not have a conflicted transaction. Um, that's very hard for you to, for at least for me, to get my head around. We'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later as well. So for folks that don't live this stuff every day, where we are in the process is these these rules were proposed as independent rules, but at the same time opening a comment period a few months ago. That comment period has now ended. The commission staff is in the midst of analyzing those comments. The outcome of that could be adopted as proposed, adopted with some amendments to reflect the comments, Reproposed, abandoned, all those things are still possibilities at this point. Comment period, like I said, has closed. There was an extraordinary amount of industry comment on this. The way I would handicap it in, in terms of most to least opposition from, from market participants would be order competition, best execution, ticks, 605. Is that... Would folks generally agree with that? Would you put it in a different order? Would you, you think one or two or, or so much more that actually just doing an ordinal rank doesn't make sense? Or, or do you think that's about right? No, I think, I think that's correct, at least from my, our perspective from NYSE, is the first two are the hardest to understand in a sense from the impact overall. So there are a lot of moving pieces between these, as Greg just walked us through, and, and it's very confusing. But if you take them together, especially for something like order competition and and on the best execution side, it, it's much harder for us and also from all of the mar- member participants, from the retail community to the options market maker perspective to the to the equity you know, traders, we all have um, a lot of moving pieces that, that we have to unpack, and it, it's best to be able to walk before we run. So going from your number four first, the 605 side, uh, going to adjusting the tick size increments, those seem to be the most um, easier, I should say, to initially walk into, understand the impacts, understanding what it means for the markets. And then, of course, you have to ask the question of why, because our markets are doing very well, as we, as we all know, um, and we heard on the last panel as well. So I would say that we would take a pause on order competition and best X um, and possibly move forward with the other two. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with that, that ranking. Um, 605, I have read 
dozens of the thousands of letters now, like 1,500 of them are form letters. I read one of those, so we'll say I read 1,500 of those. Um, but of the dozens of letters, I've seen two that oppose 605. One was Bill O'Brien. He basically said 605 didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to make retail traders uh, not use speed and commissions as their deciding factor. And he said he didn't do that, so we should scrap it. The other was Robin Hood Markets. Uh, Robin Hood basically said that instead of moving the 605 rules to retail, we should instead adapt 606 to include the execution quality metrics. Um, now they said barring that, you know, they had some opinions, but of the, like I said, dozens of letters I've read, um, they have all been largely supportive of the 605 regulations. On the other extreme side of that is the order competition rule, where both Citadel and Tyler Galash of Healthy Markets, who are arch enemies, maybe, <laughs> uh, both don't support that, right? That has been largely opposed by extremely broad swaths of the market, saying it's overprescriptive, and the SEC should really not be in the business of uh, telling us how to run, um, run auctions. So I think, I think your ranking is... Well, let's dig into that a little bit, because order competition, at least from a headline standpoint, it sounds like hey, here are things that exist on the options markets. Let's import them into the equities markets. Let's get more opportunity for natural buyers to interact with natural sellers. Let's broaden out that competition to, you know, a thousand flowers as opposed to two wholesalers. What about it makes it something that seems to bring a lot of people together who ordinarily wouldn't be together to say this isn't necessarily a good idea? Greg, on the details? is So if you... <clears throat> There's a lot that you can learn from the options market when thinking about how to, you can consider an auction on the equity side. Uh, <clears throat> the, the SEC uh, basically started by saying, we don't like the way that the options markets work for auctions. And there's a good chance, based on some of the things that it says, they're going to get to that at some level. So they've made it very clear in a variety of conversations and public statements that they are not using what goes on in options as the basis for equities. They wanted to do something that was completely different and, from what we can see, has never been done or tried in any market under whether it's futures or options or cash or derivatives or swaps or fixed income. It's a new mechanism. And the way the mechanism works is, for the very first time, at least in the world of securities, is to say we are not going to have a broker be responsible for an order. We're going to take out the responsible party. So today, the way the market works is if you're a retail broker, you are responsible for figuring out what you're supposed to do with this order. Now, in the world of options, if you want to get price improvement, you're going to have to pair it with somebody. And unless you're a retail broker that is also a market maker, you're going to have to send it to somebody who can potentially pair that order. The person who you send it to is responsible for the entire order. They have the order. They're responsible for figuring out what to do with this. May, it may result in price improvement. It may result in actually going to an auction. But that party has best execution responsibility. And if they go to an auction, as all of you know for single-leg uh, stocks, it's backstopped. It's paired. Guaranteed that you are going to get filled, and you are guaranteed that it is not going to be worse than the NBBO. And if anybody else out there, out, out there thinks that they can give a better price, They'll give it a better price, and the retail investor gets all the benefit of that better price. But the order never leaves the hand of a broker-dealer to make sure that, that that's being handled. In the new rule that the um, SEC proposed, they didn't want that. So instead, the rule is that you're going to go to an equity auction um, without the benefit of any backstopping. The order just goes into the auction, and it is announced on the public tape with most likely the name of the broker-dealer of the originating customer. So if you're an originating customer, you're going to see the name go up there. It's going to be broadcast. It's going to sit out there for, um, as Megan said, between 100 and 300 milliseconds, um, and then you're going to see what happens. Um, there's no one responsible for that order. Exchanges do a lot of functions, but they're not responsible for best execution. They don't fill the order. So the order will only get filled if there's some competition and people come in. Um, now, in principle, that sounds great, um, and it might work for certain stocks under certain circumstances, but you don't really have to do too much of an analysis. Um, the SEC can just use cat data, and they can count 
all of the times that a retail individual, an investor, wanted to buy 2,000 shares of, let's say it's not an S&P 200 stock, but maybe it's like the S&P 400 or 600, somewhere down in that range. So still, still reasonably liquid. Um, they want to buy 2,000 shares of that stock, and there's only 500 shares sitting at the NBBO. What happens? You're going to get an announcement to the entire world. There's a retail investor. Here's the name of its broker-dealer. They want to buy 2,000 shares, and there's only 500 shares sitting at the, at the far touch, let's say. Um, the 500 shares disappears like that because everybody's going to go grab those 500 shares knowing this is a retail order that has to be filled. So why would you not take the 500 shares? In fact, I think retail investors will look for this on the tape. Take the 500 shares, the price moves up, and then you sell it back, guaranteed penny that you just pocketed, and the investor who used to get the price that was on the screen, now the only thing they do is they have their broker-dealer on speed dial and say, what the heck? I don't understand. why The price on the screen was $8. How come I got it for eight hundred one? What happens to that? So right. I think that's the, that's the overall ramification of this. Greg, another I, just point to add on to that is that if in your example, what happens if auction number two comes in right afterwards, and auction number three, and auction number four, and auction number five, because they see the first one go out, what, what do you feel is going to happen in the market with you know, essentially multiple auctions happening at the same time? And, that's a huge issue. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's exactly right. And, and I was, you, you, you predicted my question for you, which is, I think the commission indicates that there's some complexity to, these, to this proposal, to this, to this structure. But do you, think, do you think they've gotten their arms around just how complex it is? Do you think in the, in the, in the process of reviewing the comments, they'll get a better understanding of, of the many different complexities that go along with attempting to sort of create this, this type of market structure? It doesn't seem like they have their, their full arms around the complexity of this. Um, another good example is if it's an option trade with an equity component, a buy right for a retail order. Now the equity side will have to be taken off, put through this auction because it's a retail equity order into this, which is already priced at a point of which the option just executed because typically the options execute first and the equity hedges right after. Now these equity portions of a buy right, for, as, for an example, will have to go through that process. And the invariability of the price point of the option, which drives the entirety price point of the, of the complex package, is unvariable. So you, you can't guarantee that's the price you're going to be trading at for $181. It, it's now maybe $250. And that's a completely different structure to what the buy right should have been. You know, Steve, Steve I, I think that you can predict a little bit by looking at how the four rules together were actually proposed and the analysis that the SEC did. So what's a little puzzling is like the example that I, just, that I had given about an order that's larger than the size of the, of the quote. So in 605, in the proposal for 605, the staff does a terrific analysis of looking at exactly that. So much so that they've said, you know what? There's this thing called size improvement, and it's so important because so many retail orders are larger than the size of the touch. They would move the market if they were placed into the market. They're backstopped by another party. It's, this is not captured in any of the 605 metrics. So they, and the reason why they do this entire analysis is because they want to justify, from an economic basis, to put these new metrics into 605. So... Mark, you'll be building those types of metrics in, in, into the systems. So in the one hand, the SEC knows this. They've analyzed that. But on the other hand, they sort of forgot this. Uh, when, they, when they actually went ahead and did the analysis, they completely excluded that construct. I mean, a whole, a whole broad, on the 605 concept, right? a big, a large number, the regulations all center around information gleaned from CAT, which of course we can't see, and the 605 reports, which they themselves say are inadequate. So the SEC, and this, this, is, this comes up in myriad letters, is you, the SEC, are sitting here claiming that we have all these flaws in the equity market based on this data that we, the SEC, have analyzed um, using the 605 data that we admit is flawed. And so I think that's, I mean, that's a, that's a root problem that we're facing with these, with these regulations is the SEC is using data that they admit is flawed in order to make decisions. So 
hopefully they listen to this idea of, look, the only, the only rule right now that should go through is 605. That is the one that, like I said, is virtually universally agreed upon because that is the one that will give the industry, give the SEC, give everybody the information they need and the transparency they need to be able to improve it. Citadel's letter talks about how simply improving that transparency has the potential to increase the execution quality by five times. Right? This is massive potential to improve the market with nothing more than transparency. And actually, this morning I was rereading the 11AC1-5, which was the original release back in 2000, and it had exactly the same concept, was that that, that transparency is really the, the minimum necessary to increase the competition. And so the, you know, the SEC of 2000 was, we want to interfere with the market as little as possible to accomplish this particular goal. And yet now we're seeing the SEC saying they want to interfere as much as possible to accomplish. We're not really sure what. That's, that's, a, that's a good summary. Um, I, I think as, as I thought about the order of things, right, that, um, that I think that is it accurate to say that, that generally folks think order competition is, is – is not a viable idea. That best X is a little bit in the middle, and then tick size and, and, and 605, and especially 605, are sort of good ideas, good things to tackle. Maybe there are improvements. Maybe there's simplicity. Maybe the, on the tick size, size side, maybe there's opportunities mixed on, missed on the 605 side. But generally, the, there are, those things are workable and can be improved. Do you think that's, that's fair that instead of one, two, three, and four, there are two that are workable, one that people think are, is probably not workable, but maybe on the fence, and one that they just think is unworkable. Do you think that's, do you think that's a fair assessment? Or I'm not even going to ask it. I'm going to say that is a fair assessment, but then I'm going to ask Megan at the same time. Do you think order competition is salvageable? And, and think about it entirely from the vantage point of where you are, right? Again, if you look at it from a headline standpoint, it's about moving flow from off-exchange to on-exchange. Is there something in there? Is there a core idea in there that if you, if you tweaked or made it a little bit more permissive or a little bit more flexible or did anything like that or created more obligations as these things get handed off, that it really is a viable governmental action? I think you have to go back to... And, and last week, I should point out that Greg and, and many of the people here were at the Sigma Roundtable, where a lot of this was discussed in detail, which was phenomenal to, to listen into and, and go through this process, because it's, it's great to hear where everybody is looking at these proposals from the industry. But I think I'm going to quote Safna here in the back. You know, I think one of, one of the things she mentioned was, uh, you know, many of these things are interconnected, but you also have to look at why you know state the problem that you're looking to solve for find a solution and and then figure out how best to set what what you want to be getting out of that what you want to be getting out of that solution so the order competition side i think there are other alternative ways on the equity side um on nyc and other equity exchanges has have a retail midpoint liquidity programs uh, that could be potentially augmented and, and changed to help provide the concept of midpoint for retail liquidity. Um, that's done on on exchange if that's what is important from the commission side. But I think it goes back to what what problem are they looking to overall solve? Um, otherwise, I would say that there's really no other middle ground available. Yeah, and, and I think that's a that's a very important articulation, right? They and having having been there, right. The government should only act when it can clearly identify a problem it needs to solve. I think it is tempted to articulate what that problem is in the order competition rule. I'm not necessarily sure folks agree with that, but that is, I think, always the first question you should ask, especially with something as complex and significant as that undertaking. Well, if you, if you look at the traditional SEC rulemaking, I think, Mark, you had, um, I think, summarized sort of the history of how they think about things very well. On, on the one hand, um, there's a lot of SEC rules that says, you shall not do this. You shall not trade through the quote. You shall not front run your customer orders. So there's a lot of do nots. Then there's some do's. You must. And those musts are almost exclusively around transparency, providing information to your clients, to your customers, to providing public information if you're a public company, et cetera. Um, there's... Almost no rules that I can think of, at least on the equity side and option side, that says 
this is how you have to, you must handle something this way. So I think what the entire industry sort of appreciates that I don't know if really translated well from a regulatory standpoint is today, if your exchange wants to create this auction mechanism, you can do that. There was probably a reason why you haven't, but it's, you can do that. Someone today can come out with a mechanism. And in fact, there are auction mechanisms that operate con- during the continuous market that some of the exchanges have put out. If an exchange creates an auction mechanism and it just happens to be exactly what the SEC said and it works, then with no other changes to rules, best execution will compel us to use that. So the structure that the SEC put in place and FINRA has put in place was if someone comes out with a better way of slicing the bread, then for your customers, you're using it or you're explaining to the regulators why you are not using this great thing that's out there. What we've never seen is a regulator to say, we don't know what this thing is going to do. We have no analysis to say that it's going to be better or worse. No one has ever done this before, but everybody must use it. What's interesting about that is when, when, you, when you say it out loud, that seems to be a pretty stark violation of best execution. Because what if, you, what if it gives you worse executions for your clients? And the answer is you just tell the regulator, you, you, you made me do it. You told me you had no choice. Yeah, I, think the, I think the key there is the forcing versus allowing or providing the tools that allow the exchanges to compete, right? Because the, the situation today is that wholesalers are, you know, retail firms wrap their order flow to wholesalers, right? That, that's a reality. And in some cases, those wholesalers may route to exchanges. They may not. Now, you know, because of the tick rules, they are not able to quote in anything less than full sense. And the wholesalers are able to trade in smaller than full cents and therefore effectively trade before the, before the exchange sees it. And so providing tools that allow the exchanges to be competitive is a reasonable goal of the SEC. Providing a mandate that everybody must use a facility that has never been, has, hasn't been vetted by literally anybody um, – is a, is a complete departure from the SEC that we've seen ever, as far as I can tell. So, segueing to best X, and SEC best X rule, which let's define for the sake of this argument as SEC best X rule that is not redundant of FINRA rule, but is, in fact, a- additional. Reasonable idea that needs tweaks or an idea that needs to be completely rethought? So I'm going to come back to something that you had said before around like the the ranking the the um, rules and in terms of of potential adoptability. Uh, so as Megan mentioned last week, SIFMA had a, um, a roundtable, and there was uh, consensus from exchanges, wholesalers, retailers, academics, market makers, pretty much across the board on just about everything except for one thing. Um, two people, not me, two other people got into a debate about is the best X rule the worst thing that the SEC has ever done or is the order competition rule? Um, and you can watch that. It was, a, it was actually a funny debate. Um, the, the best X rule is very difficult to see how, given the current structure, it's salvageable because it is extremely prescriptive. Um, so one of the actions, so the, the foundation of of the rule is that you have this thing called conflicted transactions. Um, If you don't have a conflicted transaction, so what is it transactions not conflicted? It's a transaction that there's no payment for order flow, there's no rebates, there's no principal filling by a broker dealer, you just get a hand it as an agent that's not conflicted, you're supposed to go do your normal best decks, which is you look around all the venues and you figure out what's best for the client, what gives you the best price for the client. If you're a conflicted transaction, maybe you accept payment for order flow, maybe you pay order flow, maybe you principally fill. For whatever reason, if you're conflicted, the rule says you have to go look at venues that you otherwise would not have had to look at if not for the payment for order flow. 
For the life of me, I cannot figure out why in the world you would have a rule that said, if you're one type of a customer, a retail customer, and, and your broker dealer does not accept payment for order flow, then uh, whoever is dealing with your order only has to look at certain venues for best decks. But if you do, you're going to have to look at other venues. So there's only three possibilities. One possibility is that the SEC is right and that looking at those additional venues is a really good idea. In which case, why in the world would you not do it for the other customers? Because if I'm a, then I'm going to tell my broker dealer to please accept payment for order flow because apparently I get a better deal because of best X. So that's one possibility, in which case it makes no sense. The other possibility is that um, going to those other venues that the SEC is demanding gains you absolutely nothing. Because if you did, you would use it for the other folks. And so if it gains you absolutely nothing, except it harms the client because it takes longer to process the order, et cetera. So that one makes no sense. And the third possibility is that it's equal, that it doesn't matter which one, in which case there's no purpose to the rule. So it's very hard to see how the SEC can rectify that without simply saying, we want to have our own rule at the SEC and literally just photocopy the FINRA rule, which is what we all used to do. And Mark- one thing just to jump in, I think the other area too is, so since FINRA has the current best X rule, we should always look to modernize and help improve our quality of our markets. So the other thought process is maybe we can work with FINRA to be able to establish maybe more enhanced best X practices under the current FINRA rule and to improve upon, right? That, that doesn't seem like that was even an area of a school from, from the commission side. Instead, they're putting this in in addition to, and if whichever one is more restrictive, you have to go to whichever one that would be, most likely the SEC side of the rule. So the, the SEC does have a justification for the rule. It's hard to find, but they actually do, do talk about this because um, they do not note a failure. They don't say that there's a problem with the FINRA rule, and I think a lot of feedback has been, look, if there's problems with FINRA rules, you should go talk to FINRA, and we can collectively figure out what the problems with those rules are, exactly as you said. So then, what's the justification? The SEC says the justification for the rule is that they do not have a good handle on the policies and procedures that broker-dealers are doing today for best execution. Um, I, I don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> I, you know, you're, it's, uh, so if, if that's true, and you don't have a good handle on it, I'm not quite sure how you're passing the rule. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I would hate to think that it's true because um, I think everybody here has been examined to you know nine ways of about how you do things, how you handle orders, etc. So uh, the idea of saying that we need to have a rule at the SEC because we don't have a good handle on what broker dealers does seems a little a little puzzling to me. Although I mean it's it's hard to argue, and, and I think this is what sort of struck me on December fourteenth was right. Gary Gensler came on and he said, look. It blew my mind that the, SC, that the SEC does not have their own best execution rule. And from a, a reasonable person, an average person, to think the primary regulator of the industry does not have a mandate of best execution, it's hard to argue against that, right? Like, at the root of it, it's hard to be like, no, the SEC should not have a best ex rule. <laughs> and, you know, fundamentally, I think that's where – that is absolutely the messaging that Gary Gensler has been trying for, right? He put out – cute little Twitter videos, be like, hey, we don't Office have Office hours with Gary Gensler. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I think, I think that was the messaging he was trying to put forth on December 14th. Now, frankly, I was shocked that it didn't go, uh, that it wasn't unanimously voted for, and that was sort of the surprising thing. I was like, well, hold on, why was this? And at the root of it, it comes down to this concept of conflicted transactions. So I think the, you know, to answer your question of can it be salvaged, if you get rid of the, tra- the, the conflicted transactions, maybe, right? L- you know, like Greg said, copy and paste FINRA as a starting point, not unreasonable for the SEC to have a best, best X mandate, but they just need to fix what it is. Yeah, to, to, to be clear, the, if you go through the history of best execution, the SEC has stated, I mean, you probably know this a lot better than I do, over and over, best execution stems from the duty that you get from being a broker-dealer. A rule is not needed. They always say this is a common law duty that has been there since the beginning of time. So the reason why there's no rule is because a rule is not needed for best X. FINRA has a very specific rule that says, this is how we take that common law duty and we figure out how to translate this into actions with factors, with guidance that reflects a constantly evolving market, which is why FINRA puts out reg notice after reg notice after reg notice about this is what you have to do for options, this is what you have to do with equities, this is what you have to do um, uh, for, for swaps, et cetera, as, as more things come into that fold. 
so I, I think there's, there's this perception that there was a gap, but, not, but in reality, I don't know that there is actually any gap that needed to be filled. Yeah, I had a similar but slightly different thought on December 14th hearing him say that, which was I wonder if the number of firms that have been sued by the SEC for best execution said, wait, what? <laughs> but, um, Mark, quickly, uh, 605 biggest opportunities missed. Is it, just, is it really just size improvement, or are there other things that would have made it a, a better, not just a good rule? Well, I mean, given the, given the current audience, it's hard to say, you know, it's hard not to say, look, I was surprised that 605 did not add options. Um, and I think, you know, at this point in time, if all four of these rules go forth, you should be begging the SEC to put 605 for options. And the reason I say that is because best execution has a mandate where you have to look at, you know, as Greg said, right, these, these non significant liquidity sources. And one of the key components is comparing what would happen if you did not take payment for order flow to if you did take payment for order flow. So effectively, what you need to do is look at all of your competitors and see what their executions are, if they're taking payment for order flow, if they're not taking payment for order flow. And you can get all that from the 606 reports today in the options market. But there is no source of data that gives you that information for execution quality for options. And so Effectively, what that would mean is that you are perhaps beholden to a vendor who has all that information. And while that may be good for me, it's probably not good for you. And so I think the idea of publicly disclosing execution quality on options, um, uh, Commissioner Crenshaw has said that that is going to happen. Uh, she also said some things about the auctions, but I'll let that, uh, you know, discuss that. And so I think um, 605 for options really did surprise me that that wasn't in there. Um, it may or may not happen, um, you know, provided, assuming 605 itself goes live and none of the others do, we're in a fine scenario. If best execution goes live, I think it's going to be uh, a difficult situation for options trading firms to get the information they need without something like that. Well, and that, that raises a couple of things, one of which, which we haven't talked about and I don't think we have time to talk about, is the idea... the. F- the difficulty in looking at these rules in isolation when they really are a set. And you've pointed out, I think, the, the nexus between best X and 605. We've talked about the nexus between best X and order competition. And Commissioner Crenshaw did give a speech a few weeks back talking about maybe it's a good idea to take the three that aren't already applying to options and, and have them apply to options. 605 probably is the one, as it is with this entire suite, where you could see it and it could, it could make a lot of sense. And we don't have nearly enough time to go into all the details of the difficulties on, on best X and order competition in the options world. But, but Megan, Greg, any, any additional thoughts in that space? I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think we should always work to help modernize our, our, our markets overall. And I think that if we can help provide more transparency, that's fantastic, and we should do that where, where it makes sense to do so. I also think that we, in the options space specifically, you know, we, the panel right before us with JJ's panel provided a lot of good color as far as the growth and how things have changed and how things have shifted. And it's been proven over and over again that they cont- we continue to grow and thrive into our markets, right? We, I think we have to do that in a way that, that is forward-looking, and we look at that with helping to modernize our toolkit where we can. But I also think that we cannot be so prescriptive so that we back away from the quality of the markets that we have today. And um, I think other people had mentioned our SIFMA, the, the gold standard of what we have on the equity markets as well. So I think we have to... We can consider options in many of these things, but we just have to be very careful with how we look to modernize that and not be extremely prescriptive. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think some of the challenges, we heard Commissioner Crenshaw you know, allude to that, why not just transport? They're great for equities, so why not just transport that to options? First, it's a different world. So I think a number of us did meet with the SEC about 18 months, 24 months ago, uh, to talk about a 605 for options. Um, there's a lot more symbols for options. So how do you want to divide the world? These are, these are solvable problems, but you can't just say seven numbers describe everything in the equity world. Let's just take those exact seven numbers and move them over to options. You have to do this in a really thoughtful and, and productive manner. The other thing that is a little puzzling is, 
as we mentioned, the SEC did not perform any cross analysis of the four proposals. They were issued as a package. They were issued on the same day. Um, there are aspects of those proposals that are mutually contradictory. Like there are things in there that if you adopted two of these, um, you couldn't do both at the same time because they just mechanically don't interact. So you would have to consider um, all four together. Um, the other thing that the SEC, for re- reason I'm not quite sure I understand, is they did not consider the impact of their rules on the options markets. So they do talk about best X and what this means for options markets. Um, I have a little folder here. Um, I don't know why I needed a folder for two pages, but, but they have two pages or three pages or so on what best X would mean for options. Uh, they, they have one interesting part that I thought was, was great. It said um, a wholesaler uh, may, you know, would, would have to consider for a conflicted transaction whether or not there are other auction mechanisms in the options markets that they can simply just send the order to. And then there's a little footnote, and then the footnote says, of course, actually, that's not the way the, uh, the options market works. You actually have to pair the order. You have to actually commit the capital. So that's not really what would happen. Well, okay, so then why? So, so you, they basically, in a footnote, said, yeah, actually, what we just said up here, that's actually not how it works. Um, <laughs> the other aspect that, I, that has been raised, but I, I think like the options industry really needs to get a, a handle on this. Um, if we change tick sizes, even if we just do the half a penny, is there going to be an impact on the options market? I expect that options are going to be significantly impacted. If we went to 20, 20 mils and 10 mils, I mean, someone's got to do the analysis to see what, what does this mean for the options market. Does this take us from a gazillion quotes to five gazillion quotes? I mean, there's a, there's a lot that has to be considered. And unfortunately, there's, there's no analysis at all. I don't even think commenters analyzed this or spent a lot of time because it's a, it's a lot to get your head around. I think something else that needs to be thought about that the SEC probably hasn't considered yet is when 605 initially came out, the options market execution quality increased substantially. Right? 605 for equities did not touch options at all simply because everybody came up with a standard way of comparing their brokers. Right? Every retail broker out here compares all of their options brokers using effective overquoted and statistics that were originally out for 605. So to ignore that possibility today would be short-sighted of the SEC. No, I think that's, those, are, those are all excellent points, and especially I think the point you both drove home, right, that when putting these rules, um, when proposing these rules, right, there's – there's the obligation to assess the impact of the equities proposals on the equities markets. Transporting to options it would be an obligation to make sure the options rules have an impact on the options markets. But missed in all of this, and I think something that's really, really fertile, and it's not just, it's not just order competition or, 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 or ticks, it's best execution as well, is the impact of the equities proposals on the options markets. And I think that's something where there was just so much that got thrown out people in such a short period of time. It's understandable that certain key themes got missed, but to me, I think that's a, that's a huge one. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, I don't know if I was supposed to take questions or anything like that, or I should just let people go on to cocktail parties. It's always good to be the panel right before cocktail parties. Um, I'd really like to thank our panelists. Um, you guys did a wonderful job. I didn't have to do anything, so thanks very much. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.